it's eight o'clock and uh, I wanna welcome all of you to today's Department of Medicine Grand Rounds on behalf of uh, Dr. Schnapp who couldn't be with us today. My name is uh, Nizar Jarjour and uh, I am the Allergy, Pulmonary and Critical Care Division Head. It is my immense pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Jackie Cruiser, who is an assistant professor in our division. By way of introduction, Dr. Cruiser graduated from Notre Dame University, summa cum laude, and was inducted to Phi Beta Kappa Honor Society upon graduation. She then joined the University of Chicago Medical School, where uh, she received the Gold Humanism Award upon graduation in 2010. For her medicine training, Dr. Cruiser came to UW Madison, where many of us had the pleasure of working with her as a resident and chief resident. Again, continuing her streak of honors and award, Dr. Cruiser received the Sabi Matthew Outstanding Intern Award. She went to University uh, Northwestern University in 2014, where she completed a pulmonary and critical care fellowship, as well as a health services research fellowship. There she received the best MICU fellow teacher award and the Lou Smith Excellence in Research Award. She remained on the faculty at Northwestern after completing her fellowships. And as a junior faculty, she received the faculty teaching award and a very prestigious national Parker B. Francis Research Award. In 2021, we were very fortunate to recruit Dr. Cruiser back to the University of Wisconsin as a physician scientist and she has done a fantastic job since then. As her division head, I must say that I'm so very proud of Dr. Cruiser and so appreciate her making me look like a genius for having recruited such a talented faculty. Last year, Dr. Cruiser received an Early Career Achievement Award from the American Thoracic Society, and she got the Department of Medicine Junior Faculty Outstanding Research Award. Her service extends from the division to the hospital to national professional societies. She currently serves on the UW Ethics Committee, as well as a faculty core, core faculty for our fellowship, where she is a highly sought after mentor. At the national level, Jackie is a member of the ATS Assembly on Health Services Research, and she has chaired and organized several courses and symposium at our uh, professional society annual meeting. She has been the guest editor of Clinics in Chest Medicine, special issue on critical care, published in 2022. And currently, Dr. Cruiser is serving on the program committee for the American Thoracic Society Critical Care Assembly and is in her third year as a deputy editor for Critical Care Medicine Board uh, Examination Review, published by the American College of Chest Physicians. Dr. Cruiser has already built an extraordinary strong nationally recognized research program that applies medical social sciences and system engineering tools to characterize the complex social and technical ICU environment and design specific intervention to improve ICU care delivery for critically ill patients, supporting their families and the clinicians who care for them. Her work is currently funded by a K-23 Career Award, a recent R01 Award, and the Wisconsin Partnership Program New Investigator Award all of these are aiming at improving delivery of critically ill patients. She has been very prolific and already published more than 70 peer-reviewed articles in prestigious journals. Today, Dr. Cruiser will be speaking to us on needs and goals, the role of language in the momentum of critical illness. Welcome, Dr. Cruiser. The podium is yours. Thank you, Dr. Jarjour, for that incredibly generous introduction, and I am just thrilled to be with you all today. I have no disclosures to report. And I would like to set the stage today with this image, and one that I suspect is probably familiar and recognizable for many in this audience. And I just want you to imagine that you're walking into this room, which is in an intensive care unit, and I'm sure you're noticing that it's packed full of life-sustaining treatments. You'll probably be able to pick out the mechanical ventilator in the back, the dialysis machine, the various medicines being infused, vital signs being monitored, this highly specialized bed for positioning patients with severe respiratory failure. This amazing technology, and particularly when it's shepherded by the highly skilled hands of the many professions who comprise our ICU teams, has extended the lives of many people 
And I think it's hard to argue that this is an incredible asset to our healthcare system in the United States. And I think some of you at this point might also be noticing something conspicuously absent from view as you walk into this room, our patient. I think this image helps illustrate one of the underlying arguments that I would like to make today with our time, which is that the highly technical and complex acute care environment, in particular the ICU, is exceedingly well designed to deliver urgent life-sustaining technologies. And yet, this same environment can obscure our ability to fully see the people that we're caring for. And as many of you know, there have been several decades of high quality research that have shown us the important and sometimes negative consequences of this current technology-centered ICU environment, including invasive interventions for people who are at the end of life, particularly when they don't align with patients' goals and underlying priorities, the lasting psychological impairments like post-traumatic stress disorder and anxiety in the family members and people who are tasked with making decisions on behalf of critically ill patients, and the high levels of reported conflict and distress among the, our clinicians who care for patients in the ICU. And so today we're gonna to be focusing specifically on a notion of the default language in this ICU environment. And I hope to argue for you today um, and make the case, <clears throat> excuse me, that this language both shapes and reflects how we think about life-sustaining technology in the ICU. And that by a careful examination of this language, we can both identify practical, simple changes to our everyday clinical practice, and also more directly examine some of the deeply embedded norms and cultures of our care delivery to help make more expansive change to how we provide care. So today, what I would like to cover with you is first to reconsider the pervasive language of need for patients with acute illness, particularly in the ICUs. And what I hope, if I don't convince you to avoid this word, I'd, I'd at least hope that you'd be able to identify one of the hazards, particularly when it's used in relationship to our description of life-sustaining treatments when we're talking with patients and families. And then we'll move on to a second phrase, something that's very ubiquitous in healthcare, the phrase goals of care. And I would like to examine with you a problematic tension that's exposed by this phrase. And through both of these two sections of the talk, and then more specifically at the end, I hope to be making the argument that by examining our default language very carefully, we are not only able to improve how we talk with patients and each other in our day-to-day -day clinical practice, but we're able to uncover really important features of our underlying care processes. And these processes that are so deeply embedded in our day-to-day -day work that they're hard to look at directly and then hard to change. And I'm gonna show you how some of our research has demonstrated that these underlying current processes often bypass moments that exist and that are well suited for deliberation and thoughtful choice. And if we're able to harness these opportunities, I think that there's real, there's real opportunity for change in the way that we're delivering care. So let's start with need. To need is to lack something essential. And with acute serious illness, almost by definition, these patients lack something essential namely something essential to sustain their life. So it's not surprising to me as a clinician who practices in the ICU that need rolls off our tongues as clinicians when we're caring for these patients. And I suspect that these phrases are likely familiar to many of you in the audience. If her breathing gets any worse, she will need to be intubated. I know I've said that countless times on rounds. He needs a central line, a special IV catheter in his neck, so we can give him blood pressure medicines. If she doesn't make any urine soon, she will need dialysis. If he can't be extubated soon, she will need a trach. But the way we use this term can be misleading 
and also can reveal some important things about how we think about life-sustaining treatment. And it's misleading, especially when we talk with critically ill patients and their families. And to, and, and to suggest to you how this problem comes up, I'd like to tell you the story about someone who was participating in one of our research studies. We were interviewing surrogate decision makers of patients who had previously been in the ICU, and we we're hearing from them how different courses of actions came about and how the ventilator, for example, was started for the patient. And the daughter of a patient who was in our ICU <clears throat> told us that she was at home one morning and that the physician called and said, either your mom needs to be on a ventilator or she's going to die today. Now this patient's daughter went on to tell us that the patient happened to be a retired healthcare professional with a lot of experience in the ICU setting and that her mom kept fighting back. She was never gonna be put on a ventilator. That is the worst thing that could possibly happen to her. And this was a patient who was admitted to the hospital with advanced cancer and had been in, on, the general, can't, on the general floor um, being cared for for several weeks prior to her ICU stay. And eventually the daughter agreed to go ahead with intubation and mechanical ventilation. And she told us, I trusted the doctors much more than my mom. After all, who wouldn't give a loved one something that was needed? And to look at this more carefully, let's take a step back outside of the medical context. Need isn't a word that is simply used to state facts about what is or isn't lacking. So let's take this very simple example. This stick figure does not have water. And if I tell you he doesn't have water, you may make some assumptions, but it's not necessarily telling you exactly what I think ought to happen next. But if we say that this person needs water, the very similar statement takes on a whole new meaning. It's a call to action and not only is it a call to action, but the use of the term need typically links the, the problem, what's lacking, with the, with the specific action that ought to be taken, getting this person some water. And so this is the crux of the argument that we've recently made in a viewpoint paper um, with two of my co-authors, Justin Clapp and Bob Arnold, that using the word need creates an inextricable link between a medical illness, the problem at hand, and the available medical technologies that we might have. As clinicians, we're using this word as an assessment of the clinical scenario. We think about this type of link first. In fact, we're educated and trained to think about the correct intervention for a particular medical problem and the specific indications that tell us that that intervention is needed. And then we step back to consider whether we should intubate or start mechanical ventilation. We may be assuming that patients and families can follow our logic, but after hearing that the patient needs to be intubated, they often assume it's the right thing to do. And then when we set up this conversation with a statement that a patient needs a particular life-sustaining treatment, and we try to walk back and then deliberate with the patient or family about whether it should be done, it at least isn't surprising to me that we often end up in a space of misunderstanding and conflict. And so we've suggested alternate language that creates space and undoes this inextricable link. So the phrase, what this means, is a signal to patients and their families, and it probably a reminder to us as clinicians that this is a change in health and it's likely to have a major impact on the patient now and in the future, even for those who fully recover. This alternate phrase is an intentional pause for reflection and it doesn't assume or presume the appropriate course of action. And it really is a moment for explicitly summarizing the illness and its trajectory up to this point. And this framing can also create space to attend to patients and families' emotions and distress before immediately jumping to solutions or actions. And so thinking about the patient I described to you, we may say something like this. This means that the infection in your mother's lungs is very severe and the cancer treatment is making it hard for her immune system to control it. We don't know yet if antibiotics were up and I'm worried that she could die. What to do next then frames separately an opportunity for deliberation. 
It's an open framing instead of a predetermined need. And again, it creates the necessary space to discuss what is acceptable to and prioritized by the patient. And there's often time pressure in the ICU setting and in the acute care setting in general, and in, in many outpatient settings as well. So what is said here can be brief. Let's talk about what to do next. We can intubate her and provide mechanical ventilation. It's a form of life support, sometimes called a breathing machine. This will give us time to see if the antibiotics were helping. For some patients though, being on life support like a breathing machine is not okay. Another option is to provide care that focuses exclusively on her comfort, knowing that she may die from this infection. And now I wanna take a step back and suggest to you that this inextricable link created by the word need is part of a larger notion in acute care and critical care and end of life care that's been described um, in the medical social sciences for many, many years now. And this is a quote from a very important and impactful medical anthropologist named Sharon Kaufman, who studied end of life care um, and healthcare delivery in the United States for many years. And what she said was that patients get put on a train of aggressive interventions that's very difficult to stop. Diagnostic tests confirm the need for interventions and procedures become appropriate by default in this organizational scheme. And now here the, the metaphor being used is a speeding train and others in the social sciences and in medicine have describe the same phenomenon using other terms like a conveyor belt or an airport moving walkway with sides so high that you cannot get off until the end. And with Gretchen Schwarzy and Chris Cox, um, we've developed and tried to understand how this particular notion plays out in the intensive care unit. And we've called this clinical momentum. And one of the important features of clinical momentum is that it feels as if by the time we sit down to discuss with patients and families using high quality optimal communication skills, it feels as if we're trying to undo an understanding that's already taken hold. And so to illustrate what clinical momentum is, it's useful to consider a common patient exemplar from the ICU space. So consider this patient similar to the one I've been talking through already today, who has respiratory failure and ultimately is intubated and is receiving mechanical ventilation. And in this case, the patient is not recovery by ICU day 14. But I think all of you who practice in the ICU and most of you who practice in many other settings know that this is a reductionist fiction of what a critical care and a hospital course looks like. And instead, acute care hospitalizations look much more like this where one additional problem is found that's directly linked to its corresponding intervention, which perhaps in itself um, creates another intervention, additional diagnoses accumulate over time. And over this time, that latent system level influence of clinical momentum is building. And it is permissive and facilitates and expedites the use of interventions and technologies. And as I said, this is that influence that's described as a, with a variety of metaphors, like a speeding train. It influences clinicians, patients, and families to accept and tolerate additional interventions. And because of this, it makes it much more difficult to consider alternate courses of action. And so by the time we all sit down for a family meeting two weeks into a hospital stay, the patient is dependent on mechanical ventilation and dialysis. The daughter has done what was needed for her mother. And it's often difficult to see the difference between this decision now for a tracheostomy, for example, and all of the other decisions that have accumulated along the way. An important work done in the pediatric ICU setting by Renee Boss, who's a physician scientist at Johns Hopkins, has helped explain how the influence of clinical momentum has a differential impact on clinicians as compared to families of patients in the ICU. And they've illustrated this differential impact here with this figure. And what this figure is showing you on the, on the top, we as clinicians start 
when someone presents to the ICU, we start with a very problem focused notion of the case. What is the diagnosis? What forms of life support are needed? What additional organ failures are there? And families come in very focused on the patient and who that patient was before this moment of acute illness. But over time, as clinicians, and as additional interventions are needed without the hoped for recovery, we start to recognize that the patient is dying and is unlikely to recover. And so we become more and more patient focused and start to think in the background at least about what's most important to the patient. Meanwhile, the families are observing rounds, they're getting our daily updates about all of the different changes in creatinine and FiO2 and PEEP level on the ventilator. And they've started to become, they've learned from us. They've essentially gone through a mini medical school. And at some point there's an inflection where we cross paths. And as physicians, we've been preparing now to think about what's most important to the patient, particularly as they're nearing the end of life. And the family all of a sudden is really focused on the creatinine and what the level of oxygen that's needed today. And this system level impact of clinical momentum has created this conflict that we see often in the ICU. And so just to summarize here, the word need is both reflective of and contributes to this ICU system that's primed for intervention. And by just briefly stopping and disentangling a worsening clinical condition from the related tech medical technology, just for a moment, we may be able to create the space necessary to consider the patient and what's most important to them now. And so now I'd like to move on to this second phase of the talk focused on goals of care. And I suspect this isn't a point I need to belabor in this audience, but a quick Google search can help illustrate just the notable reach of the phrase goals of care. From logos asking patients if they've had a goals of care conversation with their healthcare team, to the naming of statewide nonprofit organizations, the branding of health system initiatives, and even it can be found within this publicly available slide deck from a legal and risk management clinical in-service. And we conducted a systematic review of the phrase goals of care in 2019, and we found that the healthcare literature is no exception. And you can see here that the popularity of this term is on the rise with an almost exponential increase starting in the early 2000s. And the majority of these uses of the phrase were from clinical journals in palliative care, internal medicine and critical care and ethics as well. And while conducting this systematic review, one of our goals was try to understand what does goals of care mean? And does everyone use the same definition? So we use a qualitative technique known as discourse analysis. And what we found was that there is fairly substantial consensus on what goals of care means in the literature. And so operationally, goals of care are defined as the overarching aims of medical care for a patient that are informed by patients' underlying values and priorities, but established within a specific and existing clinical context, and then ultimately used to guide decisions about the use of or, or limitation on specific medical interventions. And we put together th this visual to illustrate how these overarching aims are at the center of a very patient-centered an individualized decision-making process where specific interventions get tailored to the values and priorities of individual patients. Now, as clinician investigators, we thought that this definition wasn't always the way we saw the phrase goals of care being used in the clinical space. And so we decided to undertake two different studies where we examined the frontline use of goals of care in the clinical context. So in one study, we examined the documentation of goals of care in health records. And in another, we directly asked almost 60 ICU and palliative care clinicians about their experiences. And what we learned is that goals of care is used in a very narrow clinical context, particularly in the ICU. That is when the clinical team has determined that a patient is nearing the end of life. So from one ICU nurse during a focus group, 
The phrase goals of care is synonymous with an end of life, end of the road discussion. We've tried everything. Let's have a goals of care discussion with the family to explain where we're at. And ICU clinicians generally recognize the end of the road as a point of physiologic failure. In other words, when all of our high technology interventions have failed to produce the desired physiologic effect. So one example here from a consultant physician who is seeing an ICU patient. At this point, we've established that all hemostatic interventions have been futile. Agree with the primary team's effort to address realistic goals of care in the context of this end-stage multi-system organ failure scenario. Clinicians also told us that goals of care can mean the clinical team is in conflict with the patient or the family. From one of the ICU fellows, I've seen goals of care used in situations where the care team feels prolonged care, ICU care will be non-beneficial, but the family is not in agreement. Oh, this family needs goals of care. It's implying the family is not on board with what we think is right or appropriate. And here again, you can see how this phrase takes on another layer of significance in the health record, where it's signaling conflict, where we're looking, we're pressing for resolution of goals of care, and we're using ethics to work towards a more mutual goals of care decision. The clinicians in our studies also described avoiding the phrase specifically with patients and families, perhaps because of these difficult connotations of end of life and conflict. It's a phrase that's often used amongst providers. We all sort of have this secret. And so the tension I'm hoping to highlight here is between on one hand, the straightforward and uncomplicated scholarly view on goals of care and its promotion as an avenue to achieve better individualized care for patients. And on the other hand, the complex arena of the ICU where this same phrase has taken on quite a different meaning and one that is latent and even described as secret among clinicians. And I'm not arguing here that one side of this tension is, is correct and the other is incorrect, which I think it's perhaps appealing to suggest that clinicians maybe don't understand the scholarly view, but in fact, they told us they understand it and that they need shorthand to communicate about these very complex and difficult scenarios in the ICU. And I think reconciling this tension will require a closer look at what we mean by goals and the implicit goals of our healthcare system. And our work and our findings from the systematic review suggest that one pathway forward to reconciling this tension is to directly examine the implicit goals and reconsider whether and when it is reasonable to take them for granted. So one of the authors um, that we uh, analyzed in the systematic review said that the implicit goal of healthcare is usually cure survival. So in many clinical areas, goals of care are reasonably taken for granted. But I wonder if it's reasonable to take goals of care for granted at this point, specifically because it appears in the ICU or in acute care settings that we're often taking them for granted up until the moment that life-sustaining treatments are not achieving their physiologic objectives. And so now I would like to move on and argue that this examination of these common phrases and our default language in the ICU system can help us learn a little bit more about the deeply embedded care processes that dictate how we deliver care. And I'd like to show you some moments that are well suited for deliberation and thoughtful choice and explain why it seems as if these moments for many patients are bypassed. I suspect in this audience, it's well known that the recognition that system level fail failures are more influential on healthcare delivery than individual human error. This, this notion has been widespread for many years now, and yet this recognition has not been met with very many tools to study, research, and improve this system and change these system level failures. And so what I'm showing you here is a 2013 white paper. So from 10 years ago now, it was a joint effort from the National Academy of Engineering and the Institute of Medicine 
describing the promise of tools from systems engineering to help address the system level failures in healthcare. And one of these tools is known as a process map. And some of you may be familiar from process mapping as they've recently taken hold, particularly in quality improvement and performance improvement initiatives in healthcare. But fundamentally what process maps are, are a visual diagram of a particular system. They show the temporal link between steps and they show how steps fold in sequence. And this is in contrast to a checklist of steps because the map shows the relationships between steps and how particular systems produce the outcomes that they produce. In other words, they're highly mechanistic. And at its core, a process model is used to show how a system produces outcomes. And it's also a very powerful tool that can capture complexity in systems. So what I'm showing you here is an example from NASA. So I will tell you that NASA is an early adopter of systems engineering and has been using the tools from this discipline for many years to organize and um, conduct their missions. And so you may be thinking, sure, this looks like quite a few steps. There's arrows, there's different colors, and it seems like they're capturing quite a bit that's going on in their mission feasibility and mission definition processes. But what I do wanna point out is that this is just one small upper corner of NASA's process map um, describing their, their mission planning process. And in fact, this is the whole thing. And so what you can see here is that there's layers of complexity that can be visually diagrammed in using these systems engineering tools. And one primary purpose of a process map is to identify dysfunctional steps in the current state, points at which the current process fails. These are system level vulnerabilities and they're targets for improving the system to produce better outcomes. And so we undertook a process mapping exercise specific to the ICU setting. This was conducted at two Midwestern academic medical centers. Neither of them were here at UW, in case you're curious. We um, used an iterative process where first we examined electronic health records. Then we conducted direct observations of the ICU space with engineers. And then we engaged members of the many members of the interprofessional ICU team and palliative care teams, as well as surrogates of patients who died or survived in the ICU and patient survivors. And so we generated one of these maps, similar to what I've already showed you from NASA, and we used the input from all of these different stakeholders, 70 total participants, to refine and improve the map and ultimately to create a visual diagram that represents how we currently deliver care specifically for patients with acute respiratory failure in the ICU. And this is the summary of the process map that we developed in the ICU space. And you can find just as NASA has a variety of different layers of complexity, Within our publication, you can find a variety of different um, sub-process maps that illustrate more of the complexity going on here. But the power of this map is that it represents care for essentially any patient who's admitted to the ICU with respiratory failure. You can take a patient from step one, which is represented in the yellow oval, all the way to their ICU endpoint represented in green whether that is end of life care that is focused on the patient's priorities, recovery to extubation, or the onset of prolonged mechanical ventilation. And not only can you follow their path, the map will help explain how that patient got to their outcome. In total, we identified three phases, 28 key steps, seven different process cycles that repeat on a daily basis in the ICU with rounds and so on, three outcomes and four distinct periods of deliberation. And that is what I would like to highlight for you today. So these are moments that naturally occur in the typical cadence of a patient's ICU stay. And they're moments that we learned are, op are useful moments for deliberation. And as I said, they occur naturally, 
But the reason that they are represented here in our visual diagram with dashed lines is that they are often bypassed or skipped. And so if a patient bypasses these moments, these naturally occurring moments for deliberation, they end up in a process cycle towards the right side of the screen where their physiology directs the continuation or addition of life-sustaining treatments until the point they reach worsening physiology and the deterioration deliberation point cannot be avoided. And with the data that we collected in this study, we were able to dive deeper to try to understand why are these deliberation periods that are so well suited to the course of critical care inconsistently acted on. And I suspect for many of the clinicians in the audience, our findings will not be surprising, but I think nevertheless, they're very important. So this is one of the quotes, to be honest, that haunts me the most from the research that I've done so far. A surrogate decision maker described to us that she knew her cousin likely would not have wanted to continue life-sustaining treatment. She was pretty clear on that, but she told us that she didn't wanna sound like I was giving up on him or that I didn't trust the medical team's ability to cure him. Me bringing it up was not the right thing. And second, we heard that there was substantial clinician level variability and some problems within the ICU team itself. So an ICU nurse told us if the attending that's on or the fellows that's on, they don't really do a good job connecting or empathizing with patients and their families, I might not address it with them. And what this nurse was talking about was a concern raised by the family member to the nurse that continuing life-sustaining treatment may not be in the patient's best interest, but the nurse has decided not to address it. And a major system level feature of the ICU, which is frequent staffing rotation. We will drop the ball in a way and say, well, I'm only on for the weekend, so I don't wanna get involved. I'm only here for one shift. And so what happens when these deliberation periods are bypassed and that patients have worsening physiology we ultimately stop at the deterioration deliberation point to address realistic goals of care in the context of end stage multi-system organ failure scenario. And again, it's not surprising to me why perhaps we may end up in conflict with patients and families at this point. And I question about whether this is the ideal moment or the best moment to be talking about goals of care. And so what I've suggested to you so far today is that our default language reflects embedded ICU care processes. And so if we think about the worsening clinical conditions, such as worsening respiratory failure and a patient who needs to be intubated, followed by the onset of kidney dysfunction, and then a patient who needs dialysis because they meet the indications for acute dialysis. When these individual um, disarticulated moments and discussions around specific interventions accumulate over time, we develop clinical momentum that in and of itself takes on the notion of a speeding train that's very difficult to stop. And by studying the underlying processes of care and these inconsistently acted on deliberation periods, we can see how this momentum plays out over time for patients in the ICU until they reach physiologic failure and a patient and a family and a clinician sits down to discuss goals of care. And in our work, and through this study of the ICU system and embedded care processes, we've become increasingly interest, interested in the promising model of a time-limited trial. Now, time-limited trials are a specific approach to patient care that have been described in the healthcare literature since the 1990s. 
And this is, to me, what time-limited trials are. And what I've shown you today is that we have moments within the course of ICU care that are well suited for deliberation, but they are inconsistently acted on. And instead of allowing these moments to be bypassed by the underlying care processes, we instead create a structured plan, a collaborative plan with patients and families to use life-sustaining treatment for defined duration and then reassess. I helped participate in a large Delphi study sponsored by the American Thoracic Society over the past couple of years, where we sought to define time-limited trials, particularly for patients with critical illness. And this is the definition that we generated. Time-limited trials are a collaborative plan among clinicians and a patient or their surrogate decision maker to use life-sustaining therapy for a defined duration. After the duration, the patient's response to therapy then informs the next steps and the next decision. And typically the next decisions are either to continue care that's directed towards recovery, if the patient is responding and improving as we've all hoped, to transition to care focused exclusively on comfort, acknowledging that the patient is nearing the end of life, or if substantial uncertainty remains to extend the trial's duration. Now, despite the promise of time-limited trials, and now this agreed upon consensus definition, we actually know very little about how time-limited trials are used in current practice. There's a lot of enthusiasm in the literature. This approach to care has been endorsed by palliative care professional societies and critical care professional societies. And yet the evidence is, is quite sparse. I've been a part of two different studies now that demonstrate time limit trials are being used by ICU physicians and clinicians across the United States, but with important variation in how they're being used. So in a survey study, we found that uh, almost all ICU physicians endorse the concept of a time limited trial, but there was extreme variation in which patients they would use this approach in. And we've just completed a 12 month pilot study here at UW and we've found something very similar while observing care directly. So what this graph is showing you are the results of this study where we enrolled all patients in our, on our medical ICU services with acute respiratory failure who were receiving invasive mechanical ventilation. And we asked their physician whether or not they were using a time limited trial approach to care. And what you can see here, so all of our, our ICU physicians are displayed across the x-axis. And the number and what's shown in yellow are the, the number of time-limited trials conducted per ICU physician. So what you can see here is there's wide variation in the current use of time-limited trials among ICU physicians. And other ethnographic work has also shown that there's wide variation in how this strategy is used across different ICUs within the United States. And so that is the focus of my current work. And perhaps I'll be able to come back and talk with you all again um, and in a few years from now after we're completed with a five-year observational study of time-limited trials in five ICUs across the United States um, in regions with variable end-of-life care practices and variable use of ICU services for patients at the end of life. And our goal of this research is to find the optimal way to conduct a time-limited trial. And with that, I would like to acknowledge the huge number of people who have contributed incredibly meaningfully to this work that I presented and represented today. Um, specifically here at UW, my longtime mentor, Dr. Gretchen Schwarzy from the Department of Surgery, who I've been lucky to work with now for um, over a decade, and Dr. Joy Moy, who has been um, leading our, our lab and um, really doing an incredible job at getting some of our complex research studies um, going. So special thanks to those. 
And I want to highlight last two of my mentees who spearheaded a lot of the work I presented to you today, including hopefully a picture that's familiar to many of you, our own recent re residency graduate, Michaela Reef, who's currently a pulmonary and critical care fellow at Duke. Her work I presented to you today and another mentee of mine who's now an assistant professor at the University of Pennsylvania. And also, of course, um, very grateful to have received funding for the research that has informed a lot of the ideas that I've talked with you all today. And last but not least, um, thank you to our, our wonderful TLC team um, here at Wisconsin. And um, I look forward to having a conversation with you all and hearing some questions. Thank you so very much, uh, Jackie, for a fantastic presentation. Um, we'll start with a question. We have a, 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 an online question that's asking you basically about how do we prepare patients and families for this periodic uh, discussion of goals of care and would a, an initial uh, in, in for informing the patient initially that we will come back and rediscuss. Does that help in uh, guiding decision making? Right. Well, I think in essence, what I hear in that question is one of the fundamental premises of a time limited trial and this structured approach to care. So the concept of a time limited trial is to sit down with patients and families perhaps early in an ICU stay or early in the course of critical illness and make a plan together. And that plan has defined milestones as to how we think the patient, um, what we would expect if the patient was improving and, and also has a defined moment to come back and talk again and to say, let's reassess in five days. And one of the hypotheses and one of the reasons that um, experts in this space are very interested and in, uh, find the time limit trial model promising is exactly what was sort of unearthed in that question, which is that it perhaps gives time not only to understand the uncertainty in the patient's prognosis, but it does perhaps give time for very difficult decisions to unfold at the pace that they need to unfold. And oftentimes, families um, and patients themselves need time to process that, you, you know, what has been um, taking place. So I think the model itself is exactly what, um, uh, uh, what is suggested in that question, which is to say, let's, let's set expectations and boundaries and milestones that really help us understand how and why we're making the types of decisions that we are. Thank you. Uh, another question is asking about a, whether subset of patients, particularly those older individuals who might have been accustomed to more a patriarchal medical care model, do they ever struggle with uh, having the autonomy in decision making and push the decision making back to the medical uh, team? Right. Yeah. And so I think so. What that question I think is a really important question and and alludes to the fact that. Um, traditionally, and, and over the last several decades, there has been a lot of interest in models of shared decision making. And often the way in which shared decision making is poised is positioned in between paternalism on one hand, where physicians or clinicians are essentially directing all of the decisions, and then sort of absolute patient autonomy on the other hand, where Clinicians essentially do not provide input, and and patients are um, are either expected or allowed to make decisions on their own. And shared decision making sits in the middle. But I think what's really wise, and 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 perhaps what's implied in that question is that it's it's not so easy. And I think the one of the the issues with the shared decision making model is it implies that. Um, the patients can kind of come with one half of the equation and physicians can come with the other half of the equation and sort of through good communication that we can come up with the right answer. And I think what a lot of our work has shown and, and what I've come to believe is that the clinical space is so much more complex than that. And the influences that build over time sometimes obscure even the opportunity for shared decision making. And so I think the models 
that we present to patients and the way that we talk with them needs to take into account the complexity of the current situation and their own preferences for whether they, how they would like to be, how they would like to participate in the decision and what extent to which physicians should be directing care. Thank you. Um, another question is, uh, you know, inquiring is whether tools have been developed uh, to guide clinicians in this uh, conversation and when to have them and how to have them. And so I, if the, the question is specifically referring to the time-limited trial model, I, I suspect, um, and perhaps that's what the answer or the question is asking about, um, we, have, we are actually the Wisconsin Partnership Project uh, program that uh, program project that you alluded to in the beginning is designed exactly to do that. So we have been um, engaging with older adults throughout the state of Wisconsin from rural Wisconsin and urban Milwaukee and Dane County to build a tool to help clinicians sit down with patients and families and to consider a time limited trial. So we're lucky to be midway through the project and we've had some good results. And so, you know, we hope to be providing some tools in that space very shortly. The other thing, the other um, um, thing I will say is that the American Thoracic Society um, in February will be publishing a patient facing um, information sheet about time limited trials. And so that is, is coming up soon. So I think that is another, it's designed with patients and families to be a resource for them to understand what we mean when people use this term. Because as, as you might expect, and um, I alluded to this briefly, the phrase time-limited trials isn't necessarily a term that is recognized by patients and families. And it's not even recognized by many clinicians, even those who use this approach to care. And so one of our objectives is to help explain that this is a structured approach to care. And what's more important is understanding the structure and the plan, not necessarily what it's called. I have a follow-up to that question, Jackie. What about uh, starting earlier, as in during training, whether it's medical school, residency, and fellowship? Are there curricula or programs to help train physicians early on so that becomes really part of their practice when they become attendings on the independent practitioners. Yeah, I, and I think I think many of the, the people here who are even on this call today are experts in education and communication education. And, you know, we're incredibly lucky to have um, many members of our Department of Medicine to have been national leaders in that regard and Department of Surgery and I, I think that there is, it's an incredibly important skill set and one that is perhaps often overlooked in the training space, um, where often we're learning about which medical interventions ought to be linked with specific illnesses, and we're less often prepared to manage, pay, to sort of to understand the human nature of medicine and how complex these behaviors are. And so I think um, I will defer to sort of all of those experts. We have many, many in our space, but I think the good news is there's a lot of attention on this educational space. And um, a lot of it is being do done here at UW and within our department. Um, so I think that we are well positioned to be training future clinicians to really appreciate the importance of, of this skill set. Another question, Jackie, is, is wondering whether uh, there is any concern that repeated time trials could uh, defer that uh, whole team perspective taking. So kind of, you know, that repeated discussion could really influence how they are looking at it. Um, I, and I think what, what I understand in that question is sort of how does the time-limited trial model um, influence the ICU team? And um, it is actually a particular interest of mine is interprofessional, how the interprofessional ICU team works together. And um, one of the things we learned in our process mapping study is that many members of the ICU team feel left out or um, 
not appropriately informed about these really crucial decisions about the courses of patients' care and the plans made sometimes between physicians, for example, and surrogate decision makers. So one striking example that we learned from our research was a physical therapist in the ICU who was going in to work with a particular patient and was under the impression from the electronic health record that the goal was to get the patient to recover um, to a long-term acute care hospital um, to liberate from the ventilator. And, and so was sort of doing their professional job um, with that goal in mind, only to learn sort of immediately after leaving the room that a major decision had been made earlier that day. And instead the patient was going to be pursuing end of life care as soon as family arrived. And just that professional dissonance of not being able to be incorporated into these major care plans. Um, and so I really believe, and what I hope to be able to show with the research that we're doing now is that a time-limited trial can provide exactly that, especially when it's done well, that it provides a structure that the entire ICU team can look at, can sort of tangibly take hold of and understand, here is the plan. And here's when we're meeting again, this is what we're looking for. And we can use that same plan to have reinforcing conversations with patients and families and to make sure that all of the different professionals who are critical to providing the care understand what the plan will be. Thank you. Another question, acknowledging that these discussions are rather sensitive, how do we avoid the, the patient and their family perceiving that if we start early, that we're really giving up on them? particularly if the person participating in the discussion from the medical team is an early career physician. Yeah. And I think that that's another really key notion of time-limited trials that are done well. And one of the things that we stressed in the recent ATS document is that this is an approach to care that should be framed by uncertainty. Um, and I, I think that we know from decades of work, and I hope that my data scientists colleagues um, um, aren't angry about this, but it is very difficult to prognosticate for critically ill patients. And in a variety of different contexts, we know that individual physicians' prognostications can be incorrect. And even and families and, and patients can interpret and value different aspects of prognostication. And so instead of using these tools and using the structured approach to care as a way to convey poor prognosis, the goal is to convey uncertainty. And what we've learned from patients and families and potential patients who have been involved in our research is that they want to hear honestly from physicians about uncertainty. I think that there's perhaps a professional norm that exists among physicians where we are hesitant to express uncertainty. Um, but what we've heard, at least in our research from patients and families, is that they want to know that the, un the uncertainty exists and they want it to be communicated honestly, but they don't want to be abandoned to the uncertainty. They want to know, I'm not clear exactly how things are going to go, and here is how I'm thinking about it. This is what it would mean if things were getting better, this is what it would look like if things aren't getting better. And that's how we're gonna address the uncertainty at hand. And so I think by framing our approach to these conversations with, with an honest and sort of accurately titrated amount of uncertainty, it in fact fosters transparency and trust instead of fosters um, the conflict that tends to arise when we sit down at the end of a complex ICU stay and then ask about goals of care. Great. Uh, Jackie, we, you know, uh, as you know, ph physicians are uh, not uniform in their uh, approach and the use of limited uh, trials in the ICU. Has your research revealed any specific characteristics or phenotype of physicians who do this better than others? So that's it. So it's, I guess it's a complex question. Yeah. Um, and we've been a little bit hesitant um, to overcharacterize. I guess one thing I would say from a scientific perspective is we don't have enough data to 
um, generalize kind of the phenotypes of, for example, who uses time limited trials and who does not. I do think it's it's an important question to the extent that it would help us understand how best to support this approach. And one of our reasons for undertaking this large observational study is to, so we know our data has shown, right, that um, some physicians are time limited trial adopters and some are not. And at this state and the state of the science, it's hard to say, we don't have the evidence to say, well, this is a clearly preferred approach to care. And so I think one of the rationales to doing this large observational study to understand the impact of time limited trials, and we're gonna be looking at the impact on patients and on surrogates, and we're gonna be measuring the impact of time limited trials on ICU team members and their moral distress and conflict um, within their own professional roles, that we will be able to have sort of a, a nicely, a rich understanding of how time limit trials are impacting the people involved in the ICU space. And then I think that will help us improve sort of uptake, assuming that, you know, what we're hoping to find is that this is, that the promise of time limit trials can be fully achieved. Well, the hour is up. And I just want to thank you so very much, Jackie, for a fantastic presentation and best of luck with your research. Thank you all for joining us. Good day. Thank you.